Okay, I'm Palmer Lucky. I'm the founder of Oculus. Um, this is my first time here at DICE, and it's been an honor to come and speak to all of you guys and also to everyone who's watching on the live stream. So, I'm super passionate about virtual reality. I've always loved games. I've always wished I could step inside games. Who hasn't? And that's why I've been working on virtual reality for as long as, as long as I've been able, which was when I got a job when I was a teenager, started making too much money. Just disposable stuff. Um, so virtual reality is still very early. We're just seeing the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's possible. But we're all ready to do things with it that we're not able to do with any other technology. And today I'm going to be talking about where I think the future of virtual reality is headed. I think that consumer virtual reality is going to come sooner than you might think. Now, how many people in the audience have tried the Oculus Rift? That's like... <laughs> Well, that ruins my next slide. If, 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 you, if you haven't tried virtual reality technology, or if you've only tried it a few decades ago, you really have to try the state of the art to understand. And just to be clear, the dev kit that we've shipped out is not state of the art anymore, at least. Um, the last few years have seen really massive, ma the last few years have seen massive software and hardware advancements uh, that have made virtual reality really possible for the first time. We have very high-powered computers and consoles that are able to render synthetic environments at high frame rates in 3D. We've never had that. We have high-resolution displays that are lightweight, small. We have high-precision motion trackers that are also very small. And the cost has been driven so far down by the mobile phone industry. A lot of these things that used to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars are now better for hundreds of dollars. So, I think that virtual reality early on is largely going to be driven by the games industry. And that's because the games industry, more than any other industry, knows how to build 3D worlds that people can interact in. Uh, there are other people that have similar skills, making 3D CG movies, you know, working on visual effects, uh, architecture visualization. But the game industry is what knows how to make things that people want to do in a virtual space. And it also helps that... Uh, Gamers tend to be more accepting of new technologies than your average mainstream consumer. And I think that there's a lot of the things that the core, <laughs> that the gaming industry figures out are going to end up being the standards that everyone else follows as they get into the virtual reality industry. People like movies or architecture, or medicine or simulation training. But at the start of virtual reality, before it goes as mainstream as I hope it will, VR is going to be driven largely by games. And I think that virtual reality is going to be main, not just consumerized, but I think it's going to be mainstream as well. And there's a difference. See, there's lots of consumer products that are not necessarily mainstream. But virtual reality has a lot of mainstream benefits. It allows them to play games that they never could have otherwise. I don't know if you guys think about it much, but playing modern games, especially first-person shooters, actually takes an enormous amount of skill and investment. You've got this crazy you know, 10, 20-button multi-analog stick controller that you're using to manipulate an abstract view on a screen that's not related to your own view. Even performing a basic task in a first-person shooter, like aiming at someone and pulling the trigger, is actually pretty hard to do. Especially with a mouse. Has anybody ever seen, uh, I've used this gag before, but I'll use it again. How many people have seen like an old person, no offense, trying to play a first person shooter and they've never done it and they pick up the mouse and the first thing they do is, is they, they go, you know, they, 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 it's hard for them to figure out how to navigate in that environment. But everyone understands how to look around in the real world. Everyone knows how to hear something and look over there or look over there. And especially as motion controls get better, people understand how to point things, how to reach out and interact with things. I think that virtual reality is going to open up gaming to even a more mainstream audience than games already are. And then I already said, it won't just be games, it's going to be other things, it's going to be film, it's going to be medicine, it's going to be science, it's going to be education, but at the beginning, a lot of this is going to be driven by games. Games, more than any other medium, have always been driven by technology. Um, I haven't been alive long enough to really make this point with any kind of credibility, but I'm told that as hardware advances, so have games, from text-based games to 2D games to 3D games to HD, 3D, streaming, social mobile games, all of these advances in technology have allowed for a gameplay that was never possible on previous hardware. For, um, <laughs> 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 I, 
I, I'm a little short-sighted, so right before this, I realized I couldn't read all my notes, so we split it up apart. Um, but we're kind of reaching a point of diminishing returns. We have games, games are still getting better. We're getting better gameplay, we're getting better multiplayer, we're getting better graphics, we're getting better frame rates, better graphics, better post-processing effects, but none of those are fundamentally changing games the way that past technological advancements have. Uh, the games of today and the games that are coming out next year feel a lot like the games that came out last year. I think that virtual reality is the first technology in a long time that makes games feel completely different. Um, in a way, VR is the ultimate medium. It's not just its own thing. It can also hypothetically, were it perfect, simulate every other medium. And if that's true, it opens the door for limitless innovation. It's an incredible technology that I think is going to revolutionize a lot of things, but especially entertainment and especially games. And especially, <laughs> games especially because of the magic of presence. And presence really is the magic of virtual reality. It is super important to take, away, take this away from the talk. If there's one thing you take away, it's just what is presence. It's the feeling that you are truly someplace else. And that doesn't necessarily mean you can't figure out that you're in a virtual environment. We're a long way away from being able to, you know, wake up and wonder if we're in a virtual world or the real world. It's about, but presence isn't about that. It's about engaging your brain on a subconscious level to believe that it's in a virtual environment and that it's in a real space. If you think about the first time that Neo jumped off a building after realizing that he was in the matrix, you know that consciously he knew that he was not in any danger. He knew it was a simulation and that he'd be okay. But subconsciously, it was difficult for him because the simulation was so convincing that on a subconscious level, his brain really did believe that he was in danger. And no amount of logic can overcome that sense of presence in a virtual reality, <laughs> of sense of presence in virtual reality. And that can make things incredible. It can make the ordinary incredible. Things that were not that fascinating on a normal screen, like uh, flying or falling, those might be good gameplay mechanics, but on a normal screen, you're not gonna feel like you're truly falling. You're not gonna feel like you're about to you know, fall off the stage. You're gonna feel like some abstract representation of yourself is about to teeter off the stage and cause some consequences related to having to go through the level again. That's very different. Um, virtual reality can make the connection between the player and the virtual world stronger than ever, and that's going to make for, I think, a lot more emotionally impactful games and adrenaline pumping, rootin' tootin' gun shooting games. Um, it's almost impossible to uh, describe without, without trying it for yourself. And the Oculus Rift dev kit that we've shipped so far really is pretty primitive compared to where VR is gonna need to go. And it does begin to provide that sense of presence. But things are going to get much better very quickly. And in less than a year, we've already created hardware, several people have created hardware that can give a sense of presence. And that's only been possible in the last few, couple, last few years. Michael Abrash gave a good talk at Steam Dev Days on what's required to achieve presence. And like I said earlier, as good as it is, the Oculus Dev Kit that's shipped so far is not anywhere close to where VR needs to be. But we already have hardware that can achieve presence. And it's taken less than a year to get there. Virtual reality is already moving very fast compared to the decades of stagnation that it's seen. And I think it's gonna start moving even faster than it's already moving because there's so many people coming in. It's inevitable with so many people driving virtual reality, with so many technology companies building innovative new hardware and software that it's not gonna move faster than it has been going already. There's gonna be massive hardware and software advancements, advancements in the near term. And uh, not just advancements, but actually even huge breakthroughs. I can't talk about all of them, and some of them might not pan out, but there are gonna be huge breakthroughs. It's not too long until we have screen tech, and when I say not too long, I don't mean this year or next year, but within the next, I would wager five, maybe 10 years, I, I would bet closer to five, we're gonna have screen technology that goes beyond the resolution of the human eye. Now there's other factors, um, like, you know, like contrast and frame rate and all of that, but we're gonna go below, beyond the resolution of the human eye. I think that the size, of weight, uh, size and weight of virtual reality hardware is going to move away from these bulky goggles to where it can be about the same size and weight as the glasses that many of you are already wearing and that I should have brought today. Um, <laughs> and I, right now, virtual reality headsets have to be tethered to 
powerful computers. And that, that's because that's what it takes to render high frame rates these days, to render the kind of worlds that we want to be in. But mobile hardware is moving incredibly fast. And I think within a few years, mobile chipsets are gonna be integrated into the headsets themselves. At that point, you have an affordable, fully standalone heads piece of hardware that can run everything right on a headset. And I think when that happens, virtual reality is gonna become an affordable, ubiquitous technology. But the future of virtual reality isn't going to be defined by the hardware. It really isn't. There's going to be a lot of players in hardware and things are gonna move faster than we can imagine. But the future of real virtual reality is really gonna be defined by content. The people who make virtual reality content and who push the limits of what a game is and take full advantage of everything that virtual reality has to offer and everything that it doesn't have to offer. Um, and it's not going to be very easy. Virtual reality in maybe more so than any other advancement in gaming is an entirely new medium. And the best content is probably going to be made, well, it will be made with virtual reality in mind. Uh, this isn't unique to VR though. It's, it's true of almost any platform. If you look at the Wii or Kinect or iOS, all of the games on those platforms and pretty much every other one were games that were designed with those platforms in mind, not ports from, <laughs> not ports from other platforms. Um, you want to design for the strengths and weaknesses of a platform. For example, a game like Street Fighter was designed for real, feelable, tactile controls playing on a large-ish screen. Porting that over to a mobile device where you have a huge array of touchscreen buttons that are all over a tiny screen, it might be an interesting experience, but it's not gonna be that good of an experience. Actually, I was astounded. Did you know that Street Fighter on iOS has like an eight rating on Metacritic? It's all from mobile review sites, but I was surprised. Um, so I'm just saying it might be a bad example, but that's what I wrote in. Um, and even if it's a fun experience, even if it's a cool novelty, it's not going to be as, as good as it would have been had it been a fighting game that was designed for a mobile from the start. Virtual reality is a lot the same. If you take existing content, you port it to virtual reality, you might get an interesting experience. Uh, it might even be better than the original platform, but usually not. Um, but most of the time, it's not gonna work well. It might make people feel bad. And there's all kinds of problems that aren't apparent on a screen that become apparent in a virtual reality game. Uh, for example, We've spent a lot of time at Oculus porting games over to VR ourselves, helping other people port their games, creating content from the ground up, the, the whole spectrum. Um, so many things. Fun thing to know is that most games with light bulbs, the light bulbs are the size of grapefruits. And they do that, I think, to make them easier to shoot. And you don't, in games where you can shoot them, and you don't notice this on a screen. You look at it and it's, it's up there, it looks pretty reasonable. In virtual reality, you look at it and you realize that that light bulb is actually a grapefruit. And same thing goes for doorways. Most games on a PC monitor, you're inexplicably short and the doorways correspond to that. So when you put someone at the correct height in VR, so often in existing games, the doorways are all ready to clip your head off. And it's not, it's not as simple as, oh, I'll just rescale the door. Oftentimes, entire games are built around interaction models that rely on this scale, like where a command, you know, where, where, a, where a control panel is, or reading a sign. You might be able to get it working, but a lot of times, especially if you didn't design the game with proper scale from the start, and you probably didn't, uh, it's gonna be, not work well. Uh, another kind of fun one was, uh, we showed Hawken working in VR at GDC and we did a lot of that work with Meteor on that integration. And something that we didn't notice on our dev machines is we were, we were working a lot on monitors. Um, we scaled up the cockpit of the mech to feel more comfortable because it was way too small. But we forgot to scale up all of the enemy mech models. And so what we were, ended up showing was uh, it, it worked fine. You were in a reasonably sized cockpit and every, all the other mechs looked pretty good until they got close to you and you realize that they were actually about the size of chickens at your feet. Uh, and that was, when you were on a normal monitor, it just wasn't apparent. It's very hard to extract scale out of something where it's the wrong field of view compressed onto the wrong sized image in 2D. It, you would think that virtual reality and traditional games do have a lot in common and sometimes they do, especially simulation titles. Uh, racing simulation titles where everything really is built perfectly to scale. That's one of the few times where you often can port it straight over to VR. But most of the time, you're 
most of the time your time is gonna be better spent figuring out what assets, what parts of your engine, what parts of your game you can reuse in VR, not trying to figure out how you can completely adapt your existing game to VR. Um, if anyone has specific questions, reach out to me because I don't have time to go into super detail. Performance is critical to virtual reality, and it's not just about, uh, you know, it's not, having good graphics is nice, but VR content right now, in order to be immersive, needs to run at a minimum of 60 frames a second, unbuffered, with VSync and stereo 3D. And those requirements are gonna keep going up as time goes on, and I know that sounds insane, but higher frame rates really do make a difference in your sense of presence, and your sense of being in a virtual world. Um, a game like Minecraft running at 500 frames a second is going to be a much better looking and feeling experience than a great game like Battlefield running at 30 frames a second in VR. Photorealistic graphics are nice, but without a high frame rate, you can't get a sense of presence. And if you don't have a sense of presence, you might as well not be using VR. And you can make people feel, feel ill if it's low frame rate. Um, and performance isn't just defined by the total frames a second, it's also defined by the latency. Um, in the past, many games have been optimized for, for higher throughput to have a greater number of frames per second at the cost of latency, which is a trade-off that might make sense on a television or a monitor where you're not gonna be able to perceive a frame, two frames of latency. But with VR, it's not just about the total number of frames. You really want to reduce the amount of time between when you move your head and when the corresponding image matches up on the screen to as little as possible. Uh, a solid sense of presence really needs a motion to photons latency loop of less than 20 milliseconds, which is pretty hard, but it is achievable. Um, the, a lot of the latency right now is actually in the game loop. It's very little is in the hardware at this point. So a lot of techniques in the past that have been used to boost frame rate are gonna have to be reconsidered. And most games that have already been designed with a monitor or television in mind are gonna need a hell of a lot of work to get running in VR comfortably. <coughs> so this is something that I added at the last second but I wanted to talk about. Virtual reality I think is going to redefine not just games but it is going to change communication a lot. There's a reason that people still meet face to face, that we still use digital services to arrange face to face meetups. There's a reason we all drug ourselves to Vegas to meet in this hotel. It's because there's something you can get from real life interaction that you can't currently get from digital interaction. You have the ability to look people in the eye, to make them feel uncomfortable. You have the ability to convey things with body language, to, you know, throw your arms all over the place. Those are an important part of how we communicate with other people, and right now there's no way to really convey that. We meet because you can collaborate in a space, you can do things together, you can perform activities, you can you know, know that you're in confidence. There's a lot of benefits to real life interaction. And right now there's no other technology that, there's, there's nothing that can replace it, but virtual reality, if not now, is going to allow for a lot of these things. It's gonna allow you to track your body, to convey body language, to track your eyes, to track your emotions, to make you feel like you're in the same place, even if you're not. So I think that virtual reality in games and just in overall communication is going to take the best, the best and most convenient aspects of digital communication where we can reach out to anyone, anyone, anywhere in the world and connect with them instantly and combine it with the authenticity of human interaction. And that's gonna be really fascinating to see where that goes, especially in games. There's still a lot of challenges ahead. Um, these are just some of them. There's a longer list, but I cut them to fit. We don't have all of the answers. I wish I could tell you how you are going to solve all these problems. Uh, VR game design is really just getting started, and we know some things that work, we know some things that don't, but like any platform, it's going to take, uh, uh, it's gonna take a long time for people to figure out how to get the most, to get, to get the most out of the platform. Um, audio is another thing. Audio is a critical part of virtual reality, much more critical than audio has been for traditional games. Most games actually have pretty poor audio. And it's harder to notice when you're just panning the soundscape around you using a mouse or a gamepad as your body, view, and head all remain lined up in the same direction. But once you have proper sixed off head tracking, once you're able to move things around in the environment that create sound, it's very readily apparent. It's very quickly apparent that the audio fidelity is nowhere near the graphical fidelity. 
and users will notice that. So audio is going to need to improve a lot, and uh, there are promising things. But part of it is just going to be a matter of effort, taking more time to do better audio in games. Um, VR input is probably the biggest challenge that we have left. We have all of the technology that we need, well, most of the technology we need to look around inside a virtual environment as in the same way we look around the real world, to be able to look at something, look over here, look up, look down, and get a sense of where everything is. What we don't have is the technology to reach out into that virtual world and interact with it the same way we do the real world. We have motion tracking, uh, we, you know, things like Kinect and the Wii, but they're really a very different game. It's doing something that's making something abstract and a little bit related to what you're doing happen on a screen across the room or a few feet in front of you. And it's very different from motion tracking and virtual reality, where you can do one-to-one, -one, two scale motion tracking, where you can look and actually see your hands, where you can see your arms and your body and feel as if you're, they're your own. Motion tracking actually goes beyond um, a gimmick and can become something extremely powerful. And not just the motion tracking, but haptics are gonna need to improve. What we have right now is basically shaking your hands around when you get shot, and that's not very next gen. I think we're going to need high definition haptics that are able to, rep that are able to replicate textures, to able to apply force to you, to make you feel like you're actually touching things in the virtual environment. It's gonna be a long time before it's good enough where we can not tell the difference between VR and reality, but we can get a lot of the way there, especially with the help of our visual system tricking us along the way. Bear with me here. I think that virtual reality could end up being one of the most important technologies in the history of mankind. Most of you probably don't agree with me, but you probably think that it's pretty cool. Show of hands, pretty cool? All right. And one cool thing about VR is that um, you guys show it, and I think even normal people show it, is that everyone understands the concept of VR. Some products, some technologies, you really have to sell people on them. You have the, Things like the you know, Fitbit. You have to sell people on why they should buy this thing, how it integrates into their lives, how it can make their lives better. But VR has been in the popular consciousness for a long time, even if it hasn't really been usable. Almost anyone, well, almost everyone knows about VR in some abstract way, and almost anyone can imagine something they would like to do with it. So it's a lot less of a hard sell than many other technologies. And compared to something like 3D TV, where I think that a lot of the demand was manufactured by hardware manufacturers and publishers and you know, movie studios trying to look for something new, a new feature that they can sell for more money, I think that VR is actually being driven by the people who make the content and the people who consume the content. And that's pretty unique in, in the content industry. What we have today virtual real in virtual reality is very primitive but it's already capable of providing experiences that you can't get any other way. And technologies like that don't come along very often. Uh, maybe once in a lifetime, twice in a lifetime, thrice in a lifetime, or never in a lifetime, depending on where in the timeline you live. The people who work on virtual reality today, I think are going to define not just the games industry, but the entire entertainment industry of tomorrow. So I've always loved playing games. I've always wanted to step into games. It's an amazing time to be a gamer, and I can't, see, can't wait to see where you guys take us next. End of slide, end of presentation. Thank you.